God, we declare tonight that our hope is in you. All of our hope is in you. And there's something about hope. The Bible says, hope make it not ashamed. I want you tonight to lift up your eyes to the Lord your God and declare that, Lord, my hope is in you. My faith is in you. My trust is in you. You are the source of my strength. You are the strength of my life. I will not be shaken. I will not be torn. I will not be destroyed. Oh, there is a name higher than any other name. It's the name of Jesus. And everything that is named on the earth, in the heavens, beneath the earth, must bow before the name of Jesus. What is that mountain that stands before Zerubbabel? By the Spirit of the Lord. Oh, someone needs to settle it in the room tonight That your trust is in the Lord Your trust is in the Lord Your faith is in the Lord Your hope is in the Lord Oh, we declare in this room tonight That you are the big-breasted God able to carry us able to carry the weight of our faith and our trust in you you are not a man that you should lie neither are you the son of man that you should repent if you have said it lord you will do it so tonight we lift our eyes to you and we declare our faith tonight in the unshaken word of God thank you Lord because not one jot and not one tittle of your word will fail as sure as we breathe as sure as you are living oh God we know that you will bring an answer we know indeed oh God that you have indeed exalted your word above your name so we thank you today for the word we thank you for the potency of the word. We declare, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. We declare allegiance again tonight. Your word is our anchor. It's an anchor for our souls. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Someone that knows that they know that they know that they know that the word of God is an answer for you. Celebrate tonight in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Please go ahead and have your seats. And as you do so, um, happy Workers' Day, right? Happy Workers' Day. Can you say that to the person on your left and on your right? and declare to them that you have triumphantly entered into the month of May. You will triumph all through the month of May in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. As our custom is on this first Wednesday of the month, we're going to spend a lot of time in prayer, you know, and we're going to share the communion tonight. But just before we do, I just want to encourage someone again in this room that God's word is indeed an anchor for your soul and if it is the word if it is God's word that you have trusted and believed then you can be sure that the Bible says that the promises of God are what yea and amen yes and amen the word of God will be a yes and an amen for you in every situation of life in Jesus mighty name so as we start out um, tonight I just want to ask that you open with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew 
Matthew chapter 7. We're going to read from verse 24 to 27. It's a story that Jesus told um, in the course of his ministry here on, the, on earth. Many of us are familiar with it, but we will remind ourselves of um, God's word tonight and stir something afresh. Amen. 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 Matthew 7 and verse 24. Therefore, Jesus was speaking here, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, Jesus says, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. Amen. Now, it's interesting to note from this passage of scripture that the two houses that Jesus described um, were built. Amen. One, the Bible says, was built on the foundation of God's word. He said one house was built on the rock. It was built on the foundation of God's word. It was built by hearing and doing God's word and acting in, instruct, in obedience to the instructions of God's word. But the second house he describes is um, an interesting situation, an interesting situation rather. It was not built out of obedience, but yet the house went up. It's interesting to note from this passage of scripture that it wasn't the storm that destroyed the house. You know, many times when we go through storms in life, when we go through shaking situations and, you know, trials of our faith, it's not the storm that destroys the house. Because if it was strictly about the storm, then how would you explain two different sets of people who go through the exact same trial, the exact same tribulation, but one is left standing and one isn't able to stand? So it's not about the quality or the fierceness of the storm. It's about the quality of the foundation of the house. Amen. Amen. And the foundation isn't something that we can ordinarily see, you know, unless the house hasn't yet gone up. Isn't that true? When the foundation for this um, structure, for example, was going up, the amount of time that I think we spent digging down into the ground to lay the solid foundations just to support this structure may perhaps have been even more intense than when the building began to appear on the outside, amen. The strength of what you plan to build upwards will determine how deep your foundations in the ground will go. Is that not true? Amen, that is indeed true. You know, Jesus was saying in this scripture, he said that, look, you, you need to come to me, you need to hear my sayings and you need to do them. So it's not strictly about what you hear. The word of God, the Bible says, is quick and is powerful. It's potent enough to divide asunder. It can cut, the Bible says, between bone and marrow. It is that potent, it's that powerful. But how many of us know that the word of God that you do not act on cannot produce a reward and a harvest for us? I pray that that will not be your portion. That the word of God that you receive will be motivation and it will inspire in you fuel to be obedient to God's word so that you will be like that servant that the Bible describes, that his master came and said, enter into the reward of your master. I pray that that will be your reward, that will be your portion in Jesus' mighty name. So it's very crucial, very, very crucial to determine the sort of foundation that we are laying for our Christian work and for our Christian life. But what does it mean to build a house on the rock? Have you noticed, for example, where it seemed like um, 
So I found this in my life and with some of my associations and friendships, for example, that you find someone that seems to, they have a good handle on their finances. It seems like they, 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 they know how to, you know, save and structure their money well. But when it comes to relationships, hello, everything is all over the place. So it seems like they've built a strong house concerning their finances. They know that they, they ought to give to God, that you give God your first and your best. They know how to save for the rainy day. They know how not to live above their means. But when it comes to the area of relationships, it seems like the house has not been built. So have you considered tonight the different areas of your life that need building? The different houses, as it were, in our lives that we need to give attention to and to be deliberate about the quality of the building. Amen. What kind of house are you building in your emotions? What kind of house are you building in your career, in your family, with your children? Amen. In financial accountability, how strong are you emotionally? Can I ask you tonight? Or maybe perhaps I should ask you to nudge the person sitting beside you. How strong are you emotionally? Yes, that was a moment to ask a neighbor. If the neighbor on the left wasn't listening, you can turn to the right and now ask the question, how strong are you emotionally? Ask, how strong are you in your spiritual life? How close are you in your walk with God? Do you hear what God says for you to do and do you obey? Or have we built up hedges around certain areas of our lives? God, I can receive your word concerning my health, the health of my body. I can quote five scriptures, ten scriptures if need be. If I feel the slightest headache, I know what to do to get up and begin to declare God's word and so that I can see the manifestation of God's healing in my body. But when it comes to the area of financial accountability, it's like we have drawn a circle around it and said, God, you can't enter here. God's word cannot enter here. If we are building a house that will stand strong and secure, if we are building a house with firm foundations that will stand the test of time and the test of every storm, then we need to give the word of God free access into every area, into every department of our lives. Amen. Can you declare with me that the word of God has free access? In my life, no area is out of bounds for the word of God in Jesus' name. Anyone can say that God is good when the seas are smooth. Amen. If you just received news of a promotion from your office. I mean, it's easy to say God is good, right? I don't even need to wind you at all. You know already, you, you, you know. It's easy to sing that song. You've been faithful, Lord, through the ages past. Amen? I don't need to say it twice. It's easy to say God is good and God is faithful when the seas are smooth and when things are good sailing. But when the storms beat upon that house, that is the time that we know the strength of the foundations of the house. When the storms are raging, is not the time for the building of the foundations. Hallelujah. The foundations need to have been built before the storm. I mean, go back to that story, the Bible um, passage in Matthew 7. It says, he who hears these sayings of mine does them. I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. So he had built the house on the rock so that in the season of trial, in the season where the storms came and beat upon the house, it had taken root. Amen. Sometimes in our finances, for example, when, when everything seems normal and everything seems okay, the rules of financial accountability just seem to go out the window. Amen. Amen what we desire, what we like, everything that seems good to me, like Solomon says, everything that seemed good to me, I did it. But perhaps maybe there's, you enter into a new season of life where it seems like you need to begin to tighten the purse strings. That's when we usually then begin to try to learn prudence. You know, we learn to say, okay, no, I, I shouldn't buy a new this or that when I know, when I know that things are beginning to get tight. But the word tonight 
is coming to us to remind us that it is in the seasons of calm seas that it is even more important that we build foundations and learn to do the word. The Bible says that he that spends all that he earns is foolish. Simple. One definition of a fool, according to God's word, is one who spends all that he has. And someone may be sitting in this room tonight and thinking, but Pastor Bola, you don't have an idea of what I earn. If you know what I earn, you know that I'm not a fool. Well, let's analyze it a little bit. I remember when I was a youth copper in this city, and even on paper, it did not seem that my, what I was taking home would take me home. But because I knew that God's word said, if you spend all that you earn, you are not wise. I just told myself, there will be savings. Anyhow it goes, there will be savings. Began to build accountability there. And then when I got my first job, I still remember that first job. My take-home pay then was 20,000 naira per annum. I mean per month, sorry. 20,000 naira per annum. No. <laughs> it was not 20,000 per annum. It was 20,000 per month. And at the time, it was such a breakthrough coming from you know, coppers, coppers, allowance, and all of that, it was a breakthrough. I celebrated that job as if I had just gotten a job with a, con a major conglomerate. Amen. But same thing, I told myself, so 20 times 12, 20,000 naira times 12, that's 240,000 naira per annum, right? And I told myself, okay, Bola, won't it be good to set yourself a target to save 100,000 naira this year? As I was setting the target for myself, even I knew that it was a tough one, right? Because before you pay for transport, before you pay for all the other things you need to do, right? As a young man or a young woman. But I just told myself, you know what? In this area of financial accountability, I will build a strong foundation. Now, someone is prob probably waiting to hear that at the end of the year, I had hit my target of 100K. No, I never did. I mean, I'll admit to you tonight, I think the highest I ever got to in building a savings for that year was maybe 40 or 50,000 naira. But what I can boldly say tonight that with God's principles and with obeying God's word, the principle is more important and more potent. Obedience and applying yourself to do the word is more important than what, than what immediately shows forth for you. Amen. Amen. Because there were disciplines I learned in those seasons that I know that even today are an anchor for me. They're a foundation for me. Amen. Someone is waiting until they hit that landmark job to then begin to apply solid financial principles. By then it will be late. You start now. Amen. You start right now. Amen. 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 So it's important to look at the season of life you're in and determine what sort of building do I want in my life? What sort of family do I want in my life? What kind of marriage do I desire to have? What kind of children do I want to raise? Do I want to have a career that will outlast downturns and cycles and seasons. And once you've determined what kind of building you would like to have in those different areas of your life, then you need to take a step back and ask, what are the materials that I need to build the kind of family, marriage, career, children, emotional strength and fortitude? Amen? What are the materials I need to build that in my life? And once you've determined what it will take to build that, amen, you ask yourself, am I even committed to building it? Because make no mistake tonight, it is the doer of the word that will be blessed. I pray tonight that you will be a doer of God's word in Jesus' mighty name. Now a house is a shelter. A house is a stronghold, isn't it? Any house, a house is a stronghold, it's a shelter. You know, it's, a, it's an inheritance, it's a store of value. It's a location found, finder. I was thinking about it tonight. Um, when you're trying to describe 
may be a route to a place. You need to know where you are and you need to know where you're going. Isn't that so tonight? So a house can be a, a place that you are targeting and you're focused on getting to. A house can be a marker for you of, of that future state that you see for yourself. It's so important tonight to determine what kind of house. I want you to ask tonight, what kind of house I need to build? Can you say that with me tonight? What kind of house I need to build will determine how I build today. Amen? The kind of house you want to build will determine how you build tonight because you need to be deliberate about the building. You need to be deliberate about the kind of building you're raising. Have you ever seen someone, for example, um, and the architect and the builders in the house will help me with this one tonight. Have you ever seen someone take perhaps the architectural drawings for a bungalow and then take the architectural drawings for like a, a shopping mall, a multi-story shopping mall, and just put them together side by side and say we're building according to the multiple designs. I mean, just try and picture that. Right? When you put together the structural drawings for a house, if you are building that one house, you need to apply those drawings to that one house. Is that not true? So what happens when you take two different designs from two different houses and attempt to build at the same time according to two different designs? Isn't that a recipe for disaster? What will come out of it at the end of the day? Clearly a disaster. But yet, as Christians, very often, we try to build our lives that same way. We say we're trusting God, we're believing God, we're building our faith on God's word. But the minute any opposing word, any opposing counsel, any opposing word comes against the knowledge of God that we've built in our hearts, we then begin to waver, we then we begin to shake and we dump everything that we're building from God's word. Amen. That will not be your portion. Tonight, I want us to be very deliberate about focusing our attention on God's word. On focusing our attention on God's word as an anchor for our faith. On focusing on God's word as a builder of our faith and an anchor for our souls. When a person is homeless, I mean, just imagine what disorientation comes with being homeless right? I mean a homeless person. No known address, no place to call home. Yet in certain areas of our lives, if we had a microscope into the spirit, maybe I should call it a spiritoscope, right? A, a spiritoscope. If we could look into the spirit right now and begin to check the different compartments of our lives, I hope we will not find ourselves homeless in our emotions. Homeless concerning the strength and our capacity to withstand storms of life. Can you nudge your neighbor again and say, this is the time to build. This is the time to build. Amen. A solid house that will stand for time and be a testimony of what God is doing in your life. You must be deliberate about what you're building. Build by doing the word. Obedience, I wrote here, is a building agent. Amen? Your obedience is a building agent. When Noah was putting together that ark of the covenant, the Bible says that God had said there was going to be a rain. And he gave Noah specific instructions about how to put that ark together, how to build that ark, how to, I mean, at the time, it didn't seem like there was any motivation for building an ark. Nothing around him in the season he was in suggested to him that an ark would be necessary. But he went ahead building. It's, it's so ironic for me to imagine that the ark that God had Noah build was the same ark that preserved his life and his family. If we had to check the different 
compartments and the facets of our lives and our faith and our walk with God? Are you building an ark that can preserve your home, can preserve your family, can preserve your life? When God gives an instruction, when God gives you a word, when God sets parameters in his word in the Bible for how we are to conduct our lives, holiness and the fear of God, we are building a house quite all right, but it is a house that will preserve us in the day of trouble. It's a house that will keep us safe in the day that the storm comes. And I pray tonight that you receive faith and grace to build a solid house, it's firmly situated and put on the rock. Amen. That will not crumble, that will not fail, will not fade and fall at the first sight of trouble. The Bible says that God's word is able to build us up and give us an inheritance among the saints. I pray tonight that God's word will indeed build you and give you an inheritance. And as I considered again that question of obedience to God's word and just building faith in God's word, faith enough to do the word and to trust that God's word has the power to preserve and to sustain us. I remembered again the story of the centurion. Remember that um, centurion that the Bible describes that Jesus himself marveled that in all of Israel I've not seen this kind of faith. What did the centurion say? He said, look, I'm a man under authority. I say to this one, go, and he goes. I say to this one, come, and he comes. He told Jesus, speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. And as I meditated again on that encounter that Jesus had with the centurion, I asked myself, what is it about our lives today that makes it difficult for us to I mean, Jesus himself marveled. You, you recall that, that story. Jesus marveled, the Bible says. I've not seen any kind of faith like this. If Jesus marveled, then it means he had not seen anything, you know, that startled him in that way. Jesus was impressed with the amount of faith that this centurion, a Roman, not even an, Israel, an Israelite, showed and displayed on that day. And I began to think again about... Um, the scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 15, sorry, and verse 10. Second Corinthians 10 from verse 3 to 6, I beg your pardon. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 to 6. Here Paul was saying, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Does anyone have any strongholds in their lives tonight? Things that you know are standing, are staring you in the face and trying to convince you that God's word does not have the power to do what God's word says it has the power to do. He says, pulling down strongholds, Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. And this is how it occurred to me. You know where it says here that we bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The way it came to me was that the way uh, many of us as believers function with God's word is we, we walk as if God's word is the one being held captive. You, you get what I mean? That when something comes against something we're trusting God for, or when an image comes against you, you're believing God, for example, for healing in your body. And then you go to the doctor and the doctor says it's even worse than before. That is a stronghold, right? That's an argument that's raising itself against the knowledge of God, isn't it? But the way we tend to react is to react as though it is God's word that is being held captive. And God was reminding me tonight that the challenge that come at us, the storms that come at us, those are not the, 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 the arresting officers. God's word is the arresting officer. The word says, take it into captivity. What does that mean? Capture it, right? That means arrest it. 
So he's saying when that, when that threatening situation comes at you, arrest it by reason of the word. He says when that news comes at you, something that, that, you were completely, that was completely unexpected, and it threatens to shake the foundations of your faith. He says by the reason of the word, arrest it. Now I grew up in an army barrack, right? I don't know a whole lot about the way the police is structured, but I know a little bit about the way the army, you know, functions. I remember many years ago, there was this one man who used to work with my dad in the military. And every time he came to our house to tell us stories about the things they went out to do as a military, um, you know, as a military squad or whatever, I just used to marvel. On this one day, he was telling this story, um, about how there was some unrest. There was some rioting in the town, in the city where I grew up, Zaria. There was some unrest, there were some riots, you know, people were being injured, people were in danger. And they went out as a company, a, a company of soldiers to go and take charge of the situation. And he says, on that day, the commanding officer that went with us was still speaking grammar. He was still trying to negotiate with them. He was still trying to, you know, just to, to, to speak English to them. And he said, we were just standing behind him, waiting for the command to arrest. He said, on, not until a stone came from that crowd of rioters and hit the commanding officer in the head. That was when he said, okay, army, move into the situation. And he said, all this while, we were waiting for the instruction to arrest. Tonight, there are things in your life that are waiting for the command to move in and arrest. God's word upon your lips is the arresting force. You are the arresting officer. You rise up according to the power of God, standing on your firm foundation of the word of God tonight and arrest. The Bible says, take captive every thought that opposes the knowledge of God. You arrest it. You arrest it, amen. You arrest it and you decide and determine that God's word has full authority in your life. And I declare to you tonight that as you stand on God's word, as you faithfully declare that God's word concerning you will not return to him void, but will accomplish all that he has set it forth to do, you will see the manifestation of God's word in your life. And when the waves beat, when the storms come, you will find strength and you will be found standing strong in the mighty name of Jesus. So can I invite you to rise up on your feet tonight and let's begin tonight to just declare again from 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 to 6. It says, for though we walk in the flesh we do not war according to the flesh in any area of your life that you have found yourself warring in the flesh warring in the flesh assuming that the physical elements are your enemy tonight i want you to receive grace to see that indeed your the weapons of your warfare are not carnal but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What are those strongholds that maybe have tried to suggest to you that God's word cannot produce? I want you to night to look them in the eye. This is how I want you to pray this prayer tonight. I want you to just look away from the person on your left and on your right. I know you've been preaching to them tonight. You've been helping me to amplify my word. But for this season, I want you to ignore the person on the left and ignore the person on the right. And I want you to look inwards. Amen. And I want you to begin to face up to those images, those pictures, those things that have suggested to you that God's word lacks potency to bring forth the results that he has said concerning you. And I want you tonight to begin to tear them up. I need you tonight to begin to make war on every stronghold, every stronghold, every stronghold, every thought the Bible says. He says thoughts are even your enemies. And I want you to begin tonight to tear them down in the name of Jesus. Where you have believed a lie concerning you, tear it down in the name of Jesus. Where you have believed that God's word cannot bring forth concerning you, tear it down in the name of Jesus. I don't know if you've had any kind of opposition standing in your way to this year, this week, 
I want you to begin to tear them down because the weapons of your warfare are not carnal but mighty. My obedience will not be held captive by my feelings. My obedience will not be held captive by an enemy thought, by an enemy force, by an enemy spirit. Tonight, I cast it down. I cast it down. I tear it down. Anything in my life that makes the word of Christ un un unable to produce fruit in me, I cast it down in the name of Jesus. And the Bible says that while men slept, the enemy came and sowed tears. I want you tonight to say, God, I don't know where it may have arisen in my life that some weeds may have shown up where the word of God should have taken root. Tonight, I tear it down. I tear it down in the name of Jesus. Because you see, the sower sows the word. And the word has full potential to bring forth in your life. The word has full potential to bring forth in my life. But he said that there was a seed that fell by the wayside. And immediately the seed was sown. The birds of the air came and began to pick it up. I want you to declare tonight every seed that you have sown in my life, oh God, that should be bringing forth for me. Ah, I insist tonight that the birds of the air will not take my seed. Your seed is a promise of your harvest. So I want you tonight to contend with everything that wants to take your seed away from you. Your seed is a prophecy to you of the harvest that God can bring forth in your life. I want you tonight to make war with everything that wants to take your seed. You see, your neighbor, your neighbor was not your enemy. Even the boss at work, the boss was not your enemy. It is everything that tries to take the seed of God's word from your heart and cause you to be unfruitful in the word of God. Make war tonight. Make war tonight. That procrastination that will not allow you to do the word, to be obedient. The Bible says that you will avenge every disobedience after your own obedience is complete. Procrastination will not have mastery over you tonight. The Bible describes another seed that was sown on the stony place. It, it brought a, 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 a root for, for a season. But when the sun came, it was withered away because it found no root. I want you to declare tonight, Lord, your word takes root in my heart. Everything that seeks to starve your word of moisture, of, of nutrients in my life, everything that seeks to choke the word of God out of my life, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches. Tonight, Lord, we make war with them in the name of Jesus. Every idea that is taking space in your heart where the word of God should occupy. Oh, I want you to serve it quick notice tonight. Say there is no more room for you. You see, the word of God must produce for you. The word of God must produce for you. If there was a soil that brought forth 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold, that means the word of God can produce for you. I want you to make the world with everything that speaks to unproductivity in your life. 
Rosere andere bo shote kere bo toko yere basiara. Roto koro bo shindere re 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 kaya ba 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 ba. Oh, the weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty. They are mighty. They are mighty through God. Tere bo shote andere ke bo bo shote re. Rato re andere bo shion andere kaya da basian do do shia takara bo bo shia. We will not walk like the unwise. We will walk circumspectly in the name of Jesus. Rasireo o shereke bobo si atakaraboshia. Riba tarabose tekereboshia. Second Corinthians one twenty one and twenty two says, "Now it is God who makes both us and you to stand firm in Christ." He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Tonight, there is no second guessing the place of the Holy Spirit in leading us. Amen. So tonight, I want you to lift up your voice and say, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I stand firm and I stand strong. By reason of the Holy Spirit, I stand firm and I stand strong. I will not contend in my own strength. I will not contend in my own power. But by the Spirit of the Lord, I stand firm and I stand strong. In the name of Jesus. He says that the Holy Spirit in our hearts is a guarantee of what is to come. Do you know what a guarantee is? A guarantee says it is because it is it and it cannot be different. I want you to see the Holy Spirit tonight as a guarantee of what the Lord has said concerning you and declare that by the power of the Spirit you stand firm, by the power of the Spirit you stand strong. Your roots go down deep and you are held firm in the name of Jesus. Your walk will be a function of grace. Your life will be a function of grace. By the power of the Spirit, you will not walk amiss. You will not dash your foot against a stone. He will lead you all through the month of May. He goes ahead of you, He makes your path straight. Those that are led by the Spirit of the Lord, they are the sons of God. Can you declare tonight that the Spirit of Sonship, you walk in the Spirit of Sonship. You walk by divine instruction because you hear the voice of the Spirit showing you which way to go. You will not walk amiss. You will not run amiss. You will not build amiss. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. And the Bible says that it is not the hearer that is blessed. It is the doer of the word. Can you lift up your hands all over the room tonight and say, Lord, grace to be a doer of your word. Grace to be a doer of your word. Grace to be a doer of your word. I receive it tonight. I receive grace to do your word. To be complete in my obedience to your word you know sometimes we we think that it is the atheist or the person outside of the church who doesn't have access to God's presence that is the disobedient one but you know it's possible to hear God's word in an area of your life and just in your inside or in your inner environment you have a conversation with yourself where you are telling yourself that look this word does not apply to me 
and God's words comes to you and says, look, this will be a year for marvelous help. He says, don't limit me. He says there will be divine instructions. But it is possible for you to have an environment inside your heart and inside your mind where you yourself are doubting the word. Can you lift up your hands tonight and say, oh God, I am renewed in the spirit of my mind. Every voice, every word, every attitude that seeks to frustrate your grace from working in my life. It has no place in me in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, go ahead and pray and declare that in the spirit of your mind, you are renewed. In the spirit of your mind, you can do what God's word says you can do. In the spirit of your mind, you have what God's word says you have. In the spirit of your mind, you are bound. In the spirit of your mind, you will come behind in no gift. You are renewed in the spirit of your mind. You know those things that have been freely given to you by the spirit. In the name of Jesus. Gideon had an inner conversation in his mind where even when God was telling him you are a mighty man of valor, he was doubting it. The ten spies, the ten Hebrew spies that Moses sent out came back and said we are like grasshoppers. Oh, tonight I want you to declare every grasshopper mentality that seeks to frustrate the word of grace, that when the word of God comes to me and to my situation, seeks to rebuff and return it, tonight I declare quick notice. I take authority tonight and I declare that you are held captive in the name of Jesus. You are held captive in the name of Jesus. I arrest you according to the power of God, by the power of the Spirit, in Jesus' mighty name. Father Lord, we thank you. We bless you. And as we approach the communion table tonight, the Bible tells us in Luke 22, in verse 7, Jesus had told his disciples to go out into a city, go out into a town. And they asked him, where would we eat the Passover? And he told them, as you go into the city, you will meet with a man holding a jug. And as you meet this man holding a jug, you will ask him for his upper room. You will ask him for the place where I will, that your master has need of. And it's interesting that in Luke 22, the Bible says that the disciples found it just as he said to them. Hallelujah. Tonight I declare that as we remember again the body of Jesus that was broken for us. As we remember again the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us. that you will receive the instruction of the Lord to you tonight. And just as it was said of Peter and John, you will find it just as he said it in the mighty name of Jesus. That as you do all that God places in your heart to do, you will find it just as he said it in the mighty name of Jesus. Father Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. You said we should do this in remembrance of you we remember again that the covenant we have with you promises us a life that is joined to you indeed we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and we thank you for this awesome privilege thank you father Lord because as we receive your body tonight we remember that Jesus' body was broken for us so that our bodies would not be broken. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. And so we receive tonight again the body of Jesus.
Lord, we receive again tonight the blood of Jesus and declare that by reason of this blood, a divine Passover is our experience in the name of Jesus. For everyone who has gone through a season of contention, we declare tonight by reason of this Passover sacrifice, that you pass over in the name of Jesus. Enter into the victory of the Lord. You enter into the inheritance of the Lord in Jesus' mighty name. As the ministers go around and serve us the communion elements, I want us to all be in an attitude of worship, knowing fully well that the victory of the cross has been established and it will be your experience in Jesus' mighty name. Oh, 